we're on. And I'm just turning this around and getting to a position where, boom. Hello, this is my God, Guns, and Guts shirt. And I think that anyone who tries to destroy and take away all guns is crazy and doesn't belong in politics. Okay, today I'm going to talk about a friend who was in a car accident. In fact, she was in several car accidents. And during the, the process, she got screwed over by her own insurance company. And to make matters clear, the insurance company is a billion dollar company. It's Florida Farm Bureau Insurance Company. And they have a lawyer Matthew Scarborough, who misrepresents things. But a lot of lawyers do that. They lie without any consequences because the judges don't have the guts to sanction them or report them to the bar. Okay, first let's get started and go through this. My name is Erwin Eisenstein. Although, if you want to find me, you have to look under Ironstone. You can do it on YouTube, you can do it on academia.edu, or you can just do it on the internet, Erwin Ironstone. I'm not a lawyer because the Florida Bar said I do not have the character and fitness to be a lawyer. They were wrong. So I have to tell you, I'm not a lawyer, but I've helped lawyers and I've assisted people who couldn't afford lawyers because in Florida, lawyers get paid so much that 60 or 80 percent of the population go to court without lawyers. That's disgraceful. And we'll go into a few things here. What do you do? when a, a lawyer or a judge lies or misrepresents the truth. Right now you can't do very much because the Florida Bar prevents you from doing it. They protect lawyers just as the judiciary protects judges. So that system eventually is going to have to change. I could give you a few ways to change it, but it, they wouldn't be listened to. Okay. Uh, if you report a condition to the bar, the bar will usually say, we can't get involved at this point. There's a case going on, and we don't want to interfere with that case. That's a perfect time to interfere. If you have a lawyer or a judge who's acting improperly, get him off the case. Sanction him. Suspend him because that costs money. And if he doesn't make money, he'll act better the next time. Uh, okay. Asking the bar to make a fair judgment is difficult and at times impossible because there's too much politics involved. A better approach may be to make a YouTube video to let the public know what is happening and what's wrong with the legal profession. I have a friend whose case involves a large insurance company. I mentioned the insurance company before. It's Florida Farm Bureau Insurance Company and has misstated information to my friend, I believe to thousands of others of their customers who buy insurance from them. An insurance company is there to make money, not necessarily to follow the law, 
and not necessarily to tell the truth. It's disgraceful. That's because insurance companies buy politicians. And when they buy politicians, that means they can buy judges indirectly or directly by making contributions. And that's wrong. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this insurance company and what happened. They failed to protect my friend when they represented her in an auto accident case. Uh, and just to say, there are a lot of things that insurance companies do that really are incorrect. There are books written about them, how insurance companies act to increase their profits by not paying for medical bills, of their own customers. One of the books is called Delay, Deny, and Defend. When you submit a claim to an insurance company, it makes sense for them to delay processing that claim. They may effectively uh, say they lost it, but they don't process a claim in a timely way. That's one thing. Uh, because you uh, have put in the claim a second or a third time, they deny it. And they deny it because they said, well, it was filed late after they refused to accept it when it was filed properly. And the third way that they screw people around is they defend. They hire lawyers whose main purpose is to screw the insurance company's own clients so that the insurance company doesn't have to pay large claims. In this case, uh, my friend was in one accident. She was in a few accidents, but she was in one accident where the insurance company refused to keep her informed. They said they were going to subrogate her claim because the other party didn't have enough insurance to pay off her claim. She needed an operation and she still needs an operation. But the insurance company, you know, and the other party evidently didn't have enough insurance so it would have come out of something called uh, UM or UIM insurance, which is underinsured insurance or uninsured insurance. And she had that, but the insurance company didn't want to pay for an operation that might cost anywhere from eighty to a hundred thousand dollars. So they delayed and they delayed and they failed to tell her what was happening. They initially told her, don't contact the other side because we don't want you to interfere with our process of collecting or trying to collect money. There's a process called subrogation. What subrogation does is it says that you don't have money now, but we have the right to sue you and say that if you get money in the future, we can get that money to pay the claim that our client has because she needs an operation. But if you don't file that claim, the subrogation claim, timely, you know, before a statute of limitations runs out, you're lost you lose the opportunity, in most instances, to file that claim. There are exceptions, and maybe in a future time we'll talk about that. So they failed to protect her when they represented her. And I mentioned the books Deny, Delay, and Defend, because that's only one of the books. And it describes how insurance companies hire consulting firms that will 
make or tell the insurance company what to do to make the most money that they can. They're not worried about their clients as much as they are in the bottom line. How much money can we make? Uh, the company has a lawyer named Matthew Scarborough, who in my opinion has misstated information to several judges without any consequences. I rip my hair out at night. How can a lawyer lie and get away with it for years? I'll talk about one of the ways he's done that. And lawyers do this in a lot of different ways. They stall, they don't send people letters in a timely way. Uh, and we'll go into it because I know I went through a divorce and what that divorce uh, allowed me to do is learn lots of things that lawyers and judges do that to me is against the law and they should be kicked out of office either as lawyers or as judges. I can talk about a judge in my divorce named Thomas Zampino. Uh, he's now retired and he's a mediator. But as far as I'm concerned, he lied, he allowed lawyers to lie to him without doing anything, he allowed them to misstate information, but judges do that because they can and there's not a hammer hanging over their heads. Effectively, most judges have absolute immunity. That means even if they screw up, you can't go after them. There are a few small areas where you can. For example, one case went to the Supreme Court where a judge was screwing around uh, with people before him, women of course, and he pleaded qualified immunity. And qualified immunity says no one has found a judge uh, responsible for this and since I'm a judge I can say I didn't know it was wrong to screw around with women. The Supreme Court reversed that case. Yay for one out of many. We'll talk about the Supreme Court also because Supreme Courts effectively prevent people from getting cases heard. And they do it by using the in-between in court, the appellate courts, and they do it by effectively uh, setting standards that no one can meet because they don't want them to meet them. Okay. Uh, there are a lot of things that lawyers are supposed to do. It's called rules of professional conduct. But what happens if a judge doesn't report them? If you're a person who isn't a lawyer, a pro se person, and you say, judge, this lawyer is lying. The judge usually ignores it because he was a lawyer and probably moving up the ranks he wasn't quite truthful on a lot of things. Okay, let me describe just one of the instances uh, where this lawyer, Matthew, has misstated information to a court. There are other times where I believe he has also, but I might be here for hours if I tried to go over just a few of the times where Matthew or his staff have misstated information or alternatively not included information that is necessary for a judge to make a fair decision. Matthew or an associate submitted a document called admissions and this document admissions is where lawyers say uh, they want the other side to agree what they say happened. And that doesn't happen because 
people like to review and say, that never happened. And in many instances, they're right. These admissions are submitted by one party who expects the other party to respond to these admissions. Most are jokes. And we'll go into some of them in a little bit. Uh, one of them I, that's in there that I'll use later is uh, the car that you were driving had seat belts. And then they say, you weren't wearing the seat belts. There's no report that the person was or was not wearing seat belts. But the lawyers say that. And if a person doesn't see it and fails to say that's wrong, our current system accepts that. Don't ask me why, but it effectively allows lawyers and judges to get away with murder, to lie. In this case, Matthew included admissions and demanded that my friend respond to them. I'm going to read some of the admissions and the responses. My friend had medical problems, so she did not answer the admissions in a timely manner. She also had a boyfriend who uh, had heart problems and died during the course of the period when she was in court with Florida Farm Bureau Insurance Company. In any case, Matthew scheduled a hearing about the admissions and then drafted an order for the judge to sign. It required my friend to respond in 20 days from December 5th, 2018. The order was stamped by the court on December 14th, 2018. So it was basically 20 days from the 5th and she, you know, wasn't drafted and signed by the court until the 14th of December. My friend did not receive a copy of the order until December 24th, 2018, the day before Christmas. So it was 19 days. Christmas was the 20th day. At that time, it was not sent by Matthew in a timely manner. How many judges send orders because they do not trust lawyers to do it on time? I know a few of them do that because lawyers lie. For example, I had lawyers in my divorce who got a judge to read an order and accept it and say that if it's not responded to in a certain number of days, then it's going to be accepted. The only problem was my ex's lawyer, Karen Haber, and Silver, I don't remember, I think it's Sherry Silver, sent the order after the date of expiration. So I never got a chance to review it and to sign it. And I'm sure Thomas Zampino, the judge, knew he was doing something that was wrong. But no one gets him, the appellate courts don't get him, and so forth. I know some lawyers who wait for a judge to sign the order and then wait a period of time before sending it to the other party. Currently in Florida, that's changing slowly because they're automating the system and many of the orders or proposed orders are sent automatically to all of the parties. Okay, the result in those cases is that one party never has an opportunity of objecting the, to the proposed order and frequently did not have time to answer it properly. This must happen frequently since some judges do not sign proposed orders until a significant amount of time elapses. Other judges send out proposed orders to all parties prior to signing them. Judges do this because they were lawyers, and they know that some of the people who were opposing them were lawyers, and they lied. Okay. In any case, 
Most of the questions are not reasonable, the admissions. No person in their right mind would agree in admissions that are not reasonable. But judges don't say that because they have to be neutral. I think there are times when judges have to be other than neutral. If something is unreasonable, a judge should intervene, especially when a lawyer and a person who's not a lawyer are involved. Uh, of course, a friend, you know, my friend, uh, I was a third party, and I was never notified by the opposing lawyer, Matthew Scarborough, uh, about issues that were not resolved in Florida court. Currently, Matthew should know that my friend filed papers in opposition to the admissions because the new judge said, look at this. It was filed on the 26th, but that's timely because you get an extra day if the day before is a holiday. Uh, Matthew Scarborough sent I don't know how many motions in and papers saying that my friend never opposed them. Now what I'm going to do now is put this down and get some of the admissions and some of the responses to the admissions. And the first one is, and I'll read it and I'll go through them all, defendants, that's Florida Farm Bureau Insurance, and the thing that's bad is they are defendants, and if their lawyers don't act appropriately, people should be aware that this insurance company screws their own clients. That's what it's about. Okay, now the first admission, and they give the rules that you have to file them by, Plaintiff received benefits from a collateral source as defined by Statute 1 or Statute 2. Florida Statute for Medical Bills alleged to have been incurred as a result of the incident described in the complaint. Okay, now people sometimes do get insurance from other sources. I get Medicare, but that doesn't mean that the insurance company should not pay uh, for medical care uh, when the insurance policy includes that. People shouldn't be included and basically shouldn't be paid twice, but they certainly should be paid once and it should be done timely so that they have an opportunity to go to the hospital and have any of their problems, the medical problems, due to an accident paid for by one of several insurance companies. Okay, now that was one. Let me see if... Okay, my friend, it's called a plaintiff, denies that medical that medical bills were alleged. What that means is she had medical bills. She went to doctors, she went to hospitals. They weren't alleged bills. Alleged says, and Scarborough says, she's making it up. She has a bill from a hospital and from a doctor. And he's saying they're alleged because he doesn't want his client Florida Farm Bureau Insurance Company to be responsible for paying the bills. Okay, that was one. Statement is not applicable as a plaintiff does not have medical bills that were alleged. These are real bills. Okay, the third item is plaintiff received benefits under the personal injury protection portion of an automobile policy for medical bills alleged to have been incurred as a result of the incident described in the complaint. That's a mouthful. 
Okay, and what, what it's really saying is Florida has something called PIP and it's personal injury protection and everyone is supposed to get insurance for $10,000 uh, to pay for medical bills. And again, the, those bills are paid not for alleged damages, but because someone is hurt and a doctor has examined them. Sometimes they take x-rays, sometimes they take MRIs, but in any case, they're examined, so they're not alleged. What does my friend say to this? Plaintiff denies that medical bills were alleged. Those are real bills. The plaintiff may have received some benefits for the permanent injuries she received from the accident under the personal injury protection portion of an automobile insurance policy, but the defendant has failed to provide a detailed amount of any such payments uh, as requested. In other words, her insurance company or the other insurance company paid up to $10,000, but they never told her what they paid. And she's asking, how much have you paid? Okay, I'm on the fourth admission. Now realize if a party doesn't respond to these admissions, they're considered truthful, and in this case the defendant can say, nah, 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 nah. they didn't respond to the admissions, so we're going to use them against her. Okay, the fourth basically admission, plaintiff is entitled to receive benefits under the PIP, personal insurance protection uh, portion of an automobile policy for medical bills alleged to have been sustained as a result of the incident described in the complaint. They're saying the harm that she suffered are alleged. I mean, if you broke a leg in an act, in an auto accident and you go to the hospital, they say it's alleged. It didn't happen. Okay. And that was fourth. The statement is not applicable as the plaintiff, the person, my friend, does not have medical bills that were alleged. These are real bills. Okay. The fifth one says, plaintiff receives benefits under the medical payment provision of an automobile insurance policy for medical bills alleged, again throwing in the alleged, to have been incurred as a result of the incident described in the complaint. So they're saying that she and you know basically received uh, money or the doctors and hospital bill did based on uh, PIP, which is personal injury protection portion of her insurance. And my friend says, plaintiff denies, saying, I deny that medical bills were alleged. The plaintiff may have received, may have received benefits for the permanent injuries she received from this accident under the medical payment portion of automobile insurance policy, but the defendant has paid, failed to provide a detailed accounting of any such payments as proposed. Discovery is still ongoing. In other words, you have to write to them. Can you tell me who you paid to? Because I don't know who got what. And again, that's doctors who may not quite tell the truth at times. And the other thing that I'd like to raise here is PIP, which is primary, what is it? PIP is the insurance that the state requires everyone to buy so that they have uh, money to pay for their health care. Problem with PIP, at least one of them is, it probably hasn't been updated in 15 to 20 years. So 
when you try to get money to pay for medical care, it's not enough. So one of the things, I'll throw this at the legislature in Florida, and probably in many other states, they should update their insurance required so that people are covered when there are accidents. Okay, six, plaintiff is entitled to receive benefits under the medical payment provision of an auto insurance policy for bills alleged to have been incurred as a result of the incident described in the complaint. And they're saying she's entitled to get money. And the statement is not applicable as the plaintiff does not have medical bills that were alleged. If you don't say that they're not alleged, then the insurance company say, you can't force us to pay. We haven't seen any of the medical problems. They're, they're alleged, they're made up. Okay, number seven. Plaintiff is subject to a deductible under the personal injury protection portion of an automobile insurance policy. And the plaintiff, my friend says, the plaintiff cannot agree at this time and will rely upon the facts still being discovered through different uh, means in a trial or in a court case. Interrogatories, you ask the other side to answer uh, questions. Depositions, where the other side or you get a chance to ask them questions and have it uh, stenographed and video recorded and other discovery as to the details of the policy in effect at the time of the accident because not only your policy it's the other policy and the other person's insurance policy. Plaintiff received benefits according to personal a group health insurance policy for medical bills alleged to have been incurred as a result of the incident described. Okay, what does that mean? Uh, that means that the two health insurance, you have private insurance and then you have auto insurance, the auto insurance is trying to get the private insurance to pay saying there weren't any problems. These, any uh, things that happened during the accident were alleged. They didn't really happen. Okay, number nine, let's see, the eighth denies that any medical bills were alleged. Uh, my friend is not a doctor. Any of the bills that were written up to any of the insurance companies were done by hospitals or doctors. So you have to wonder whether the doctors and hospitals are telling the truth. Again, that's another area that really needs investigation. Uh, number nine, from the admissions from the defendant. Plaintiff is entitled to receive benefits according to a personal group health insurance policy for medical bills alleged to have been incurred as a result of the incident. Now, if uh, you have two insurance companies, the lawyer is representing the auto insurance and he doesn't want to pay uh, a single, you know, a wooden nickel if he can get another insurance company to pay it. Uh, the statement is not applicable as the plaintiff does not have medical bills that were alleged. Again, so you have the plaintiff and you have two insurance companies now. Now, the next one, which is 10, plaintiff at the time and place of the incident described in the complaint had available a functional and operational seat belt or shoulder harness restraint system. So their lawyer, Scarborough, or one of his associates, is saying 
her car has a seat belt or a shoulder harness. And my friend says, yeah, it does. I agree. It's functional and it's operational. The 11th question on the admissions, plaintiff at the time and place of the incident described, which, which is the accident, was not using the available functional and operational seatbelt harness restraint system. Now, what the lawyer is saying, she wasn't using the seatbelt. I know this person, she always uses a seatbelt. And what does the uh, plaintiff say? Plaintiff denies and using the available functional and operational seatbelt. She's saying to them, where did you get that information from? I was there, I was wearing the seatbelt. How can you lie like that to a court? And if she didn't respond to them, their lawyer would use that against her in a trial. He would go to the jury and said, here are the admissions. You see, I said she wasn't wearing a seatbelt, and she didn't deny it. So if you don't deny it, it's assumed to be true. Now, something like that has to change. The courts have to change. And the judges have to recognize that lawyers lie very frequently. And they don't, and that's a problem. Okay. Now, the 11th admission... They say, my friend, at the time and place of the incident described, was not using the available functional and operational seatbelt. So they're saying, she wasn't using the seatbelt. And my friend says, I deny that. And she said, I was using it. Uh, now that, <laughs> it's almost like two parties saying, uh, you didn't use the seatbelt. And my friend says, I was hooked into the seatbelt. If I weren't, my injuries would have been worse. Next, they say, and this is what every person says, the person in the other side was at fault for the subject motor vehicle accident. They're saying, you didn't do something properly. It's your fault that the accident occurred. And my friend says, you've got to be crazy. I deny that. And anyone would. And if they didn't deny it, the judge should look at them and say, are you crazy? But that never happens, because judges have to be impartial. Okay. The thirteenth is, plaintiff did not suffer a permanent injury as a result of the subject motor vehicle accident. Now, here you have a time when lawyers are acting like doctors. They're saying she didn't have a permanent injury. That's something that really should be based on hospital reports, x-rays, MRIs, and doctor's reports. So what did my friend say to that? She denies she did, did not suffer a permanent injury. In other words, she's saying... I have an injury that was based on, you know, that very accident. Okay, now we have a few left and I'll have a, a nice time with these. Plaintiff's use of the available functional and operational seat belt or harness uh, at the time and place of the accident in the complaint would have prevented or lessen the injury and damage alleged by the plaintiff. And let's see what my friend says. She says, the statement is not applicable as a seatbelt and the shoulder harness restraint, restraint system was used. And if she didn't use it, the accident would have caused additional damage. Now, these two next admissions are addressed to me. So I have to read them and laugh. It says, and you realize 
They were never given to me because I was not a party to this case. In other words, the lawyer put this in and said, Erwin Eisen, I'll read both of them together. Erwin Eisenstein created the complaint in this case. What he's saying there is, I wrote what happened, uh, how one car hit another car uh, from behind, and I'm not sure about what else is in the complaint. I didn't write it, but here he's saying I did write it, and I never got this, so what can happen, and I'll explain what did happen. And then the next and the last one says, Erwin Eisenstein has created the motions and memorandums filed by uh, you in this case. It's saying that I wrote all of the papers for my friend. Now, was I ever told that I wrote the papers? No. The admissions never went to me. So effectively, they're blaming for me for something, and they're not telling me they're blaming me. Now, obviously, that's a lie. Uh, and my friend says, he, you know, the plaintiff, she denies that I created the complaint in this case. She also denies that I created the motions and any of the papers refuting things in this complaint. But I never got them. And I have to be very careful here because, you see, once they accuse you of creating a complaint, of filing motions, they can accuse you of unauthorized practice of law, and that's criminal in Florida. Now, Florida has a system that's broken. Most people can't afford lawyers. But if they ask a friend of theirs, what should I look at? Where should I look it up? And the friend says, I'm not sure. Why don't you look up Florida law to see what Florida law says? That's the unauthorized practice of law, according to Scarver. And he reported me first to the judge. And then the judge, which is who is a retiring judge, his name is uh, John Marshall Kest, I think. He was about 70 or 71, and I think he was a little senile. And he, he listened to Scarborough and said, report it to the bar. Say it was unauthorized practice of law. And Scarborough then must have told him, what about the attorney general? And said, do that too. So these two are having, I'm not there. I have no idea what they're talking about. But they're reporting it. Now, I have lots of problems because I'm not a lawyer. No one that I talk to says I'm a lawyer. They say I read a lot. They say that uh, I can check spelling and grammar, uh, but they can't say that I wrote the papers. In this case, my friend wrote the papers. But what happened is, I video record things. And this lawyer, Scarborough, didn't want anyone around because he wasn't acting appropriately during the time when he took a deposition of my friend. The deposition is where he talks to her and says, uh, excuse me, isn't it true that you hit your brake and that's why you got hit in, in the back? And I think if I were there, I wouldn't have a chance to object to that. But if there was a break, I might tell my friend, why is he yelling at you? That's not proper. But lawyers do that all the time to try to get an advantage. And I think one of the things that's needed in our system is a much 
different system. And I'll go to a Supreme Court case that talks about that. The case is Johnson versus Avery. And it's a case about one prisoner helping another prisoner. And because he helped, I think, I'm not sure which is Johnson, which is Avery, uh, but I think Avery was a prisoner. He was in jail for life sentences. And I guess he must have helped people in jail because no one else is around to help them. And the Supreme Court, I think it was uh, Abe Fortas, said, you know, the state, the prison, acted inappropriately uh, by locking up the prisoner and holding him in a cell where he uh, was separated. He didn't do anything wrong. The state has a duty to help the ignorant and uneducated in criminal matters. Sometimes it said the state has a duty in civil matters to help someone who doesn't have a lawyer. And the question is, can someone who is not a lawyer, who's educated, help? I don't know. It depends. It depends on the situation. It depends on the person who's helping. I have a law degree. I have a law degree from an accredited ABA, American Bar Association, uh, law school. And I passed the Florida Bar, and I passed the New York Bar. I was a little contentious going through my divorce, and I sued four or five judges because I believed they acted inappropriately. That was before I went to law school. But I guess those two bars, the Florida Bar said, we don't want him in our bar because if a lawyer screws up, he may report him and help the person sue that lawyer. In the other instance, New York said the same thing. They said, he files too many lawsuits. I thought that's what lawyers were supposed to do. And I did it when I wasn't a lawyer because I felt something was wrong. And I'll go into some of the things that are wrong with our current system or current systems. I think that insurance companies pay off politicians. Lawyers pay off politicians and judges. And sometimes those lawyers get to handle estate cases, that's where a person dies and there's money left, and those lawyers get paid nicely. And if they hadn't paid off this judge, they probably wouldn't have gotten that case and wouldn't got paid off. In any case, I think, and if you take a look at the, this, the concurring opinion, one of the other justices agreed with Justice A. Fortas, and his name was uh, William Douglas. And William Douglas says, hey guys, you know, lawyers can't do everything. They have law clerks, they have typists, they have researchers, and you can't say that these people shouldn't be available to help lawyers, and in some instances, people who can't afford lawyers. I know it, it happens in other parts of the country. So the question is, and in some instances, I think there's one case where uh, the Supreme Court has questioned whether it's proper for the bars or a particular uh, association to be governed by people who do business in that area. I think it's North Carolina uh, Dental 
cleaners. And I went to the U.S. Supreme Court. Right now, for example, and I hate to say this, but I buy software programs. And some of those software programs deal with law. And they have a whole bunch of forms that they print out based upon information that you put in those forms. For example, one of them might be a power of attorney. I won't even explain that, but it's a legal form. If you go to a lawyer to fill out a power of attorney, they can charge you 50 to $300. The software package is $50. So if someone asks me, you know, what do you do uh, with a power of attorney? I say, you have lots of choices. You can go online. What is it? LegalZoom, which is a software company that allows you to fill in forms and to print them out. And there are other, you know, I have one called My Attorney, and it gives about 20 different forms, or maybe more than that, that uh, you can use to fill in information and to print it out. So instead of paying, you know, 200, 300, 400 dollars, you buy the package for 50 or 100 dollars, and you can use it over and over and over again. And I think there are other cases that the Supreme Court has heard where it's defined when groups can gather together uh, to hire lawyers to assist members of the group. One might be uh, Virginia Railway Trainmen versus uh, Virginia State Bar, but there are a whole bunch of these cases that says, hey, you know, lawyers have a monopoly, and they're trying to keep it a monopoly so they can make two, three, four, five hundred dollars an hour. That doesn't make sense. Okay, I'm going to uh, finish up now. I went over the admissions. And I went over, oh, by the way, uh, Mr. Scarborough finally uh, agreed that he screwed up. But it was after a new judge heard my friend's case and saw the papers where she put in the response to the admissions uh, on time. But in the meantime, through two judges, he was yelling and screaming and putting in papers saying she hasn't done this and she hasn't done that. I give her a lot of credit for all of the work that she's done independently. And I think it's a shame that the bar doesn't help people with problems uh, where they can't afford attorneys. I think the bar should be ashamed of itself. Okay, now, I had made some notes, and it's interesting because there are some cases that never would have been heard if you didn't get persistent people. And one of them, uh, I think I read it yesterday, and it had to do with uh, it sort of makes me cry because I get upset when lawyers and judges screw people because of politics. In this case, uh, Duncan versus Louis Duncan versus Louisiana was a case where a uh, black kid was charged with assault and he was had a lawyer assigned 
and the lawyer asked for additional time to do something. And the judge in the case said, fine, I'll grant the time. And then he had the lawyer locked up because the lawyer was not licensed in the state of Louisiana. And this case went on, I guess for about three or four years, maybe longer, and it went to the Supreme Court. And the issue was, when can someone have a jury trial? And it varies. But in this case, Louisiana uh, didn't have a jury trial if someone was locked up for a simple assault and an alleged simple assault because it didn't happen. So I wanted to just say the judge in that case and the politician fixed the court. Political parties fix the court. Right now you have a Republican governor in Florida that gives him certain leeway in appointing state court judges. Do I think that's right? Not really, but I, I'm not sure how I would do it differently. Well, maybe I do, but I don't think the governor would like it, and I don't think the political parties would like it. I mentioned Johnson versus Avery, famous case, because what it did is it forced the state, I, I'm not sure which one, may have been Tennessee, uh, to establish some type of law clinic so that uneducated uh, or illiterate prisoners could bring actions to help them to protect their rights. Uh, and I think that that's basically uh, what I wanted to point out. I also wanted to say that in Florida, uh, I believe I got screwed in several ways, and I'll probably talk about that. And I think I'll talk about it because uh, they did things to me that they do to other people who are older. They're more, and as far as I see it, they're more likely to make it difficult, more difficult, for older people to apply to the Florida bar and then to be admitted to practice law in Florida. And I know at least two other people who had similar circumstances. I'm not perfect by any means, but after what I've seen judges do, and after what I've seen lawyers and legislators do, something has to be done to take the disciplinary uh, board away from judges and away from lawyers because uh, someone who is not a lawyer doesn't get a fair shake when uh, the board is processing a complaint. I've seen it in my case, and I, I, I'd say that some of the laws and rules by the far, Florida Supreme Court are probably unconstitutional but in order to get a case up to the Supreme Court is almost impossible. Doesn't happen frequently. Okay, until the next time. Uh, have a good day. The temperature here is about 75 and Florida is 
a strange place, but the temperature is nice. Thank you.